Today, though, we're, we're launching into a new message series called The Holy Spirit. And so over the next couple months, we're going to explore who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, how the Holy Spirit impacts our lives on a daily basis. Uh, so this is going to lead us up to the first Sunday of, of Advent, Advent or the four Sundays preceding Christmas. Uh, but when we get to Advent, we're not going to stop talking about the Holy Spirit. In fact, we're going to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in the birth story of Jesus and, and how Jesus comes to inaugurate a new way for us to experience God. And then in January, every January, we have our Kingdom Builders emphasis where we focus on what God is calling us to do um, in our community and around the world. And again, that Holy Spirit emphasis is going to continue as we talk about the, the Holy Spirit as the foundation and the, the fuel for missions. So, so over the next three, four months at Christian Chapel and, and perhaps longer on the, the backside of that, we're just going to keep exploring what the scriptures teach us about the person, the work, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I have uh, been a, a pastor long enough to know that when you talk about the Holy Spirit, for some reason, it creates different reactions than the other two members of the Godhead. So, so this morning, if I said, hey, we're going to start a four-month series on God the Father, the universal reaction is, okay. Uh, if I said, we're going to talk for the next four months about Jesus, it's all right. And if we talk about the Holy Spirit, suddenly it's like, ah, wait a minute. Is this going to get weird? Is there going to be some stuff happening that I don't like? And, and so kind of over the years, I've learned there are some different reactions people have to the Holy Spirit. So some of us, we get nervous when we hear that we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And the reason we're nervous is because, honestly, there's a lot of weird stuff that gets blamed on the Holy Spirit. And if you, so Christian Chapel, we're an Assemblies of God church. The Assemblies of God is a, a Pentecostal fellowship of believers. What that means in its most basic sense is that we believe the events of the day of Pentecost, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, continue to be the model for the local church today. Um, now, within that, uh, if you've grown up in Pentecostal or charismatic churches that put a heavy emphasis on the role of the Holy Spirit, I am pretty confident that you've seen something weird happen at some point, and it got blamed on the Holy Spirit. So just, just so we're on the same page, it's, it's fine. How many of you have ever seen something weird happen, and it was blamed on the Holy Spirit in a church, in a prayer meeting, on TV, uh, on, you know, just, just anywhere. TV, everyone's like, yep, yeah, for sure, I've seen that one. Uh, you know, it's just, I, I don't know why it is. Um, in my general experience is uh, the Holy Spirit is not weird. He is supernatural. He's not weird. People are weird. And weird people do weird things. And in church, it's easy just to say that was the Holy Spirit because then I don't have to deal with the fact that I'm weird. Uh, you know, and, and so, so if you're nervous, I, I get that. Uh, sometimes we're, we're really apprehensive about it. And now if, if you're apprehensive about the Holy Spirit, it's different than I've seen some weird stuff. It, apprehensive typically in, in my experience with, with talking with people is rooted more in I grew up in a church where I was told that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were not for today. Like that those were good and what we see in the scriptures that really happened and he really did heal and there were words of prophecy and there were tongues and interpretation. There were all of these things. Um, but I was taught that those gifts were just to start the church. And then once the, the first century church kind of had, had launched and got going and all the apostles had died, that, that that work of the Holy Spirit died with them. And so if that's your background, what, what I have found over the years at Christian chapels, I've had a lot of conversations with people who they, they come to Christian chapel and they, they begin to engage in worship and they join a small group and maybe their kids are in chapel youth or they're, they're in chapel kids and they're really enjoying it and they're finding life. And, and then because we're a church that embraces the work of the Holy Spirit, we eventually talk about the work of the Holy Spirit every year. And, and oftentimes that's a point where I or one of our other pastors will get a phone call or we'll get an email and, and somebody will say, you know, something. To, they're very polite with it, but something to the gist of like, we didn't know you were that kind of church. And now we're not real sure, right? And, and what are they apprehensive about? They're apprehensive about, they've been told that churches who believe these things also like, well, just wait till the snakes come out, right? And all the other weirdness that's going to come with it. And so I, that is, if that's you this morning, I want to let you know, 
myself, our pastors, we are never offended or put off by that email or that request to sit and talk. There is nothing we love more than sitting down and talking about what the scriptures say about the Holy Spirit and his place in your life. And so, so if you're apprehensive, I want to kind of try to put you at ease a little bit this morning. For the next four months, the goal is not to get you to sign off on some kind of denominational statement of belief. Right, we're not trying to, like, I don't have to prove my Assemblies of God bona fides uh, to my superiors over the next couple months. That's not it at all. There's no hidden agenda. Our only purpose is to say, what do the scriptures teach? And so if you're apprehensive, I want to put you at ease of, hey, you are, you are more than welcome to disagree with me. All I ask is every week that we come and our, our arguments are based in scripture. And that we are willing to submit to the idea that God may have a plan that is different than what we had planned for ourselves. And that could involve the work of the Holy Spirit in some supernatural ways that might challenge us, might stretch us. But if we see them in the scriptures, that's, that's all we're looking for. So, so we're not looking to push you past the scriptures. We're not trying to say if you're introverted, you have to become extroverted. We're not trying to say if you've never danced your whole life, you need to dance on Sundays. We're not saying you have to shout. We're not saying you have to do any of these other things that might be associated with spirit-filled, Pentecostal, charismatic churches. All I'm saying is over the next couple months, can we all agree we're just going to come, we're going to see what the scriptures say, we're going to ask the Spirit how they apply, and then we're going to open our lives up to being obedient to what Jesus says to us. So, so if you're apprehensive, I hope we can put you at ease. And, and I know for some of us, when we hear we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, we just get excited. Because you've grown up in this, right? You've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And, and I know, because I, I talk to people, I know that, that as soon as we start down this road, there's always a few who are like, well, it's about time. I couldn't wait. What if we, why would we ever talk about anything but the Holy Spirit? You should talk about it all the time and everywhere you go and everything you're doing. Let me tell you how my church used to do it when I was growing up. And let me tell you about this camp experience. I went to this conference. Have you heard of this prayer group? And have you heard of it? And let, just let me tell you, I got enough resources. I got enough books to read. Okay. I, I, I'm, I, I believe that that's good for you. I am happy for you. I thank God he's speaking to you in those ways. I am thankful for the experiences you had as a child and a teenager. I'm thankful for the way that God worked in my life 30 years ago. But when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're not asking God, will you take us back to the way things used to be? We're asking God, will you release the Holy Spirit right here and right now in powerful, meaningful ways to us? So we're not trying to, again, adopt some old form or pattern to prove our spirituality. But if you're excited, I do want to affirm that. I'm excited too. Right? I, if I wasn't, we wouldn't be doing this. I'm excited to see what the scriptures teach about the power, the presence, the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm excited for you to experience it because I know the Holy Spirit has changed my life. And I know the Holy Spirit has changed the lives of so many other people, and I believe he's going to do the same for you as well. And then for some of us, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, our response is one of curiosity. One of, you're not opposed to it. It's just, I've never really heard this taught. I've never really thought about it. I've never really studied what the scriptures say. And so, honestly, you're one of my favorite people to talk about the Holy Spirit to. Because you're just coming in, and, and you've laid down your own agenda and you're just saying, hey, I just want to hear what the scriptures say. And if the scriptures tell me that there's certain experiences with the spirit that are good for me, that Jesus designed for me, I just want to have those. And, and so if you're curious, I want to say just maintain that kind of holy curiosity over the next couple months. But I, I do want to challenge you of your curiosity about the Holy Spirit was never meant to just lead you to an intellectual acceptance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always experiential. He is someone that we experience in personal and profound ways. So, so it might begin as intellectual curiosity, but, but allow it to push you past that into a, a real personal experience with the Holy Spirit. And, and then the, the last category that, of people that I often see when we talk about the Holy Spirit is those who are hopeful. Those who just feel that there's something in my relationship with the Lord that just seems lacking. There's just something that feels a little dry, something that feels a little dusty, some part of it that feels a little impersonal. And it's, it's not that you're not a follower of Jesus. You love Jesus and you walk with him and you read the Bible and you're engaged in community and you're practicing spiritual disciplines and you're doing all the things that, that you should be doing. 
And it's not as if you're about to walk away from your faith. It's just that, that you, at times when you study the scriptures, when you gather for worship, when you're in a, a time alone, when you're praying or talking to a friend, there are times that you just feel like there's, there's just something missing in my relationship with God. There's a connection to the Lord that I see in others or that I hear in the way they talk about him that I don't quite have. And, and if that's you, if you're in that hopeful, anticipatory state this morning, then I just want to encourage you. The Holy Spirit is going to speak. He's going to work. He's going to move in your life. One of the prayers that God always answers is when his people ask him for a greater experience of his power and his presence. And what we're going to find over the coming months is the primary way God sends his power and his presence is through the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, so today is going to be kind of a, an introduction for us. Normally at Christian Chapel, uh, we plant ourselves in one passage of Scripture, and we try our best to exhaust everything that the Lord is saying to us through that. Now, we'll do that over the, the coming weeks and months, but for today, I want to give us kind of a, an overarching view of who the Holy Spirit is, um, why Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to us, and how the Holy Spirit is for each one of us individually. So we're going to start in Genesis. We're going to work all the way through to uh, the book of Acts, talking about who the Holy Spirit is, what he does, and what it means for us today. So, so I'm going to teach a little bit more than, than maybe we normally do. Our, our format might be slightly different, but the truth underlying it is going to be the same. So the, the first thing we want to start with this morning is the idea that the Holy Spirit is God. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we are affirming one of the central beliefs of the church, that God is three in one. He is the Trinity. He is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We affirm this on a monthly basis at Christian Chapel when we recite the Apostles' Creed together. You see it in the statements of belief in churches all around the world, throughout church history. We all agree God is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so that's important for us today to understand because when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about the third weird member of the Trinity who kind of occupies a, a wing and is only for like the super spiritual Christians who really want more of God. But when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about God. And so again, this should bring comfort to us in the same way God the Father doesn't intimidate us and God the Son doesn't intimidate us. So God the Holy Spirit is supposed to be accessible and comforting to us. And, and so today, my hope is that we can embrace that. And, and again, it's, it's interesting because what you find in, in churches around the, the U.S. and in parts of Western Europe especially is where we live in, in more anti-supernatural, uh, with more anti-supernatural worldviews, it affects our view of the Trinity. And so if you were to, to observe the way different churches uh, minister and talk about the Holy Spirit, what you would find is, is in many churches, it seems as if the Trinity has been changed and is now God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scriptures. And this is where we, and the Holy Spirit is just kind of like, he's there, but we don't do that, right? And, and so what I, I'm trying to help us understand today is that the Scriptures are very clear to us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so what that means is in the same way you were created to be the sons and daughters of God, the same way you were created to walk in relationship with Jesus Christ, so you were created to live in relationship with the Holy Spirit, to receive his power and to receive his presence. We see this all the way at the, the beginning of the creation story. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1 Verse 2, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So in the creation story, we, we see the reference to the Spirit of God, bringing order out of chaos through his powerful words, his powerful action. And in the creation story, you see all three members of the Trinity working together. God the Father is over it. The Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And then with the Word, Jesus Christ, the Word of God, creation is spoken into existence. And it's the Spirit who executes that to bring order out of the chaos. And so what this means for us today is that a couple things. First, it's a reminder that the Holy Spirit is God. He always has been and always will be. 
The Holy Spirit was not some late addition to the Trinity by the New Testament church. But from the creation of all that is, the Holy Spirit was existing and active with God the Father and God the Son. Second, it's a reminder to us about the creative power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who hovers over the water when the earth is formless and void. And so it's a reminder to us that in any space in your life where you're praying for the creative power of God to be on display, where you're praying for order to be brought to chaos, where you're asking God to bring form and meaning in the places that are meaningless and void, what you're actually asking him for is to release the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life in all of his creative power, just as he did when all of the world was spoken into existence. So again, what this means for us is the Holy Spirit always has been and always will be God. We continue to see it in the creation story. You skip down to verse 26 and we read about the creation of humanity. We covered this in our community series several weeks ago. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So as we discussed uh, several weeks ago, when God made us, he makes us in his image. And his image is one of plurality, one of community. God eternally exists in community with himself, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so the the Holy Spirit is not just involved in the creation of the world. He's not just the one who executes the words that Christ speaks or the will of the Father. But the Holy Spirit is actually involved in the creation of humanity. And so you are not just created in the image of the Father. You are not just created in the image of the Son. But you are created in the image of the Holy Spirit. And what this means is that in the same way, there is a part of your soul that longs to know you're the son and daughter of God. What are you longing for? A connection to God the Father. In the same way, you long to know you are loved, accepted, and brought in the family of God. What are you longing for? You're longing for a connection to God the Son. In the same way, you are created to live in relationship with the Holy Spirit. And as long as you hide him, resist him, or hold back from him, your experience of God will in some way be incomplete and lacking. We are created in the image of the Holy Spirit, which means we are created for more than just intellectual agreement with a set of religious rules or principles, but we are created for a spiritual connection to God and a spiritual connection to each other. The fullness of your experience with God and the fullness of your experience with others will require a connection to the Holy Spirit. It's vital for us to understand. It's vital for us to embrace. But then if we had time, we could go all the way through the Old Testament. We could work through the stories of the prophets and the kings of God's people in and out of exile. And again and again and again, we would see examples of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit working, moving, acting to draw people into God's plan. But let's skip ahead to the New Testament. We're going to move past the Gospels. We'll start in Acts chapter 5. We'll come back to the Gospels in a moment and see what Jesus teaches us about the Holy Spirit. But I want you to understand that the early church also reiterated this idea that the Holy Spirit is God. So in in Acts chapter 5, we find a story about a man and a woman, a husband and wife named Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, And I would bet you have never met a man or a woman named Ananias or Sapphira. The reason is they're not role models in the scriptures, right? Same reason you probably don't know a lot of Jezebels. Uh, like just there are certain, some biblical names carry on, some biblical names died in history. And Ananias and Sapphira names that died then and in history. So Acts chapter 5, here's the story. They are members of an early church. In the early church, they've recognized the needs around them. They've been brought into the family of God. They're walking by the power of the Holy Spirit. They've embraced their places. The sons and daughters of God, they're taking on their new identity as Christians. The church is growing. It's active. And they're recognizing we have a lot of people who are in need. And so the believers come together and they share their possessions. They live as one. It's this beautiful picture of generosity. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira apparently have some degree of wealth, and they decide they're going to sell a piece of property that they own, which is all good and wonderful. The problem comes when they decide they want to be known as generous people without actually living as generous people. And so Ananias and Sapphira, they sell this piece of property for X amount. And then they go to Peter and the other apostles and they tell them we sold it for Y amount. And they've kept the difference for themselves. 
Now, they, there was no need for them to do this. They could have just given what they wanted. But again, they decided they, they not only wanted to make a gift, they wanted the attention that came from supposedly giving all that they had received. And so they come and offer this gift, and the Spirit speaks to Peter about what is happening here. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold, and after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And so our, our point for today is to, to understand for Peter and the early church, Peter associates lying to the Holy Spirit with lying to God. So it's, it's just a very simple correlation I think we all can understand. Of, for Peter and the apostles, they believed in God the Father, the divinity of Jesus Christ is God the Son, and they believed in God the Holy Spirit. This is historic Christianity, that the Holy Spirit is God. And, and I know it may seem that I'm kind of beating this into the ground this morning, uh, and to an extent you're right, but I would also tell you uh, it could have been much worse. It could, I could have spent a full hour or two working you all the way through the Old and New Testament to make this point clear that the Holy Spirit is God. And, and here's the reason why it's so important that we understand that the Holy Spirit is God this morning. Because the Holy Spirit is supernatural. And because the gifts of the Spirit and the work of the Spirit sometimes call us out of the, the natural inclinations of our culture especially, Sometimes it's easy for us to have a view of God the Father demands my absolute obedience. And Jesus Christ deserves the same. But the Holy Spirit, he's just there to make suggestions. And what I want you to understand is if the Holy Spirit is God, then he is not there for you if you choose to follow him. He's not there if you just think you really have a need. He's not there just for if you think there's another level in your relationship with the Lord you want to achieve. But if the Holy Spirit is God, then it means his power, his presence, his gift, and his fruit, his commands and directions carry the same authority and weight as the Father and the Son. And in the same way that followers of Jesus would never want to look at the Father or Son and say, I hear what you say, but I'm not going to do that. We must become equally uncomfortable with resisting or sidelining the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit is fully God, which means he is fully in charge of my life. And that when he speaks, he's not inviting me to a debate. He is giving me commands. And my job is to obey and to follow. And, and we'll see as we work through this over the next couple of months, the Holy Spirit calls us to do all sorts of things. And he does them by the will of the Father and to glorify the Son. And everything he asks us to do is going to be confirmed in the scriptures. It's going to be affirmed by other believers. So, so you don't have to worry. He's not going to call you to some extra biblical weird thing over here. But when the Spirit speaks, our job is to remember he's God and I must obey. The, the next thing I want us to see this morning is that the Holy Spirit is a gift from Jesus. As you work primarily into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and somewhat in the book of Acts as well, what you discover is that the majority of the New Testament teaching on the Holy Spirit comes from Jesus himself. So again, the, the Holy Spirit is not some late addition by the apostles as the church is being started. But from Jesus' own mouth and from his own life and ministry, we see that God's plan was always to send the Son in the person of Jesus Christ and then to send the person of the Holy Spirit when Christ ascended back into heaven after he had accomplished his purposes on earth. And, and so what we'll see this morning, we'll just work through maybe three or four uh, passages where Jesus talks to us about the Holy Spirit. Some of these we're going to revisit in the, the coming weeks and months. The first we see is John chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Now, again, we'll come back to this and, and dive into it in detail. But what I want you to understand this morning first is the setting in which Jesus says this. 
This is towards the end of his three years of public ministry. Jesus looks at the horizon of his life and he sees that very soon he will be arrested. He will be beaten. He will be crucified and he will die. He will be laid in the grave. Three days later, he will rise from the dead. He will spend 40 days interacting with the disciples, teaching them, encouraging them, trying to help them keep moving forward. And then he will ascend to heaven. Jesus knows that a dramatic change is coming for the disciples. And the way he begins to prepare them for this change is not by telling them everything that's going to happen, but instead by pointing them to the promise of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus tells them a couple things here. First, he says, I will ask the Father and he will give to you. Reminding us that the Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father and the Son to us. We don't earn the Spirit's power. We don't earn the Spirit's presence. We receive him like a gift, just like we receive our place as God's sons and daughters, and just like we receive salvation through Jesus Christ. He says the Holy Spirit will be an advocate to help you. Another way to translate that word advocate is helper. It means that the primary role of the Holy Spirit is to help God's people follow him to help the church establish itself, to help you hear God's voice, to help you follow Jesus. Then he says the Holy Spirit will be with you forever. The Holy Spirit is not a temporary gift to the early church or the apostles. The Holy Spirit is God's eternal gift to his church. It's a gift of himself that he does not revoke and intends for every believer. And then he tells us that he will be the spirit of truth. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit to help us recognize, receive, and participate in the truth of who he is and the truth of his kingdom. As you skip down to verse 26 in John 14, you find Jesus saying, The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send you in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. So so we want to think of this in, in two ways this morning. First, the primary application was to the disciples who were gathered that day listening to Jesus. And he tells them, the Holy Spirit will teach you everything that I've said. And he'll remind you of everything that I've said. Now, think, for we, think with me for a moment who is in the crowd that day when Jesus is teaching them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James. The authors of the majority of the New Testament stand there that day as Jesus tells them, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit is going to remind you of everything that I've said. And so when you sit down right now and you read your Bible, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when you read from Acts, when you read the writings of James, when you read John's epistles, when you read read the letters Peter wrote to the churches he started, when you read these letters, what you're reading is the fulfillment of John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit did show up. The Holy Spirit did fill the early apostles. He did bring to mind everything that Jesus had said. And the scriptures that we now hold dear are are proof of the Spirit's work in the world. And so, so it's, it's fascinating because what it means is there are churches who, who are nervous about the work of the Holy Spirit and yet on a daily basis submit to the result of the Spirit's work. The Scriptures exist because the Spirit came. The disciples weren't following Jesus around for three years with notepads, making sure they were ready for after he died and was resurrected and ascended into heaven. They were just following him. And it was only the Spirit who came back and reminded them of all the things Jesus had said and all the things Jesus had did. Now, there's also some application for you and I today. The Spirit is still a gift from Jesus to us to remind us of everything he said and to teach us everything he did. And so so you might think this morning, I have never experienced the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. But if you have ever read the scriptures and felt like something jumped off the pages into your heart, if you have ever sat on a Sunday or another group and heard somebody teach from the scriptures and it's resonated inside of you, if there was a moment where you recognize your need for Jesus and you received him as your savior, if you heard the lines of scripture in a song, if you read them in a devotional, if they came to mind in your time of need, all of that was through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so what I I hope to help you understand, especially if you're nervous or apprehensive about the person and work of the Holy Spirit, is if you follow Jesus, you have already been subject to the person and work of the Holy Spirit. 
You might not have had the language to understand it. You might not have dug deep enough in the scriptures to realize it. But you never follow Jesus. You never read the scriptures without benefiting from the work of the Holy Spirit. And he still promises to bring to mind the words of Jesus. He still promises to give you direction, wisdom, discernment. He still promises to bring you comfort and conviction. And the primary way he does that is by bringing to mind to us the words of Christ and the words of Scripture. And so Jesus tells us, this is why I'm sending the Spirit. Because you're not on your own. Jesus isn't trying to just give you the information and then hope you pass the test in the end. But he's telling you, I'm going to give you the one who will bring every answer to your mind in the moment that you need it. As you you keep reading in John 15, Jesus continues to teach us about the Spirit. He says in verse 26, When the Advocate comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Now, again, this is an idea we'll come back to later and develop more fully. But what I want you to understand this morning is Jesus is telling you that the Holy Spirit is always involved in testifying about Jesus to us and testifying about Jesus through us. And so so what that means is because you follow Jesus, it's because the Holy Spirit testified to you that you were a sinner in need of a Savior. The Holy Spirit testified to you that Jesus was the Savior who takes away the sin of the world. The Holy Spirit testified to you that it is only through Jesus that you would be saved. And then the Holy Spirit testified to you as you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus was Lord. It was the Spirit who brought assurance of your salvation. So the helper helps you know that you're saved. He helps you know that you belong to Jesus, but his work is not just internal. Once we have this testimony, it now turns external and we become part of God's testimony in the world. And we'll we'll come to this in in coming weeks, but one of the the primary ways that the Holy Spirit impacts the church is by giving us power to witness. And this is the first whisper Jesus gives us where he says, you also must testify. And the disciples know they will testify because they've been with Jesus from the beginning. You and I will testify because he has changed our life, and we will testify that by the power of his Holy Spirit working in us. Then as you move down to John 16, verse 7, Jesus tells us one last thing for this morning. Truly, I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come, but if I go, I will send him to you. So so I don't know, I'm I'm sure many of you have read this verse before. I don't know how much attention you've given given to it, but every time I come across it, it makes me stop. If I come across it studying for a message, if I come across it in my my annual Bible reading plan that I'm doing in the mornings, every time I come to to John 16, 7, it just, it causes me to stop in my tracks and and really kind of ask, really? Because do you hear what Jesus is saying? Jesus is telling the disciples, the best thing that can happen for you and your relationship with the Lord is if I get out of here. Now, I don't know about you, but I have spent much of my time as a Christian wishing that Jesus was physically present next to me. Because what better way to know what God wants than to turn to God and say, what do you want? And this was the experience the disciples had. Can you, can you imagine the, the comfort they would have had? I mean, Jesus sends them out and says, go drive out demons, heal the sick. And they know if they run into one, they can't get They go bring in the big guns. Like, hey, Jesus, we tried. This one's extra crazy. He's like, no problem, I got it. They knew if they crossed the sea in the middle of the night and the boat was about to drown, I guess it's time to wake Jesus up. And he just speaks and everything is calm. They knew if they didn't catch any fish on this side, they'd just wait for Jesus to tell them to throw their nets on the other side. And then they'd almost sink the boat with everything they brought in. They knew if they were hungry out in the mountains, They just had to bring Jesus a couple loaves of bread and a few fish, and he could feed the multitudes. Can you imagine the the comfort of being physically in Jesus' presence? And yet Jesus tells the disciples, it's for your good that I go away, because if I don't go away, the advocate will not come to you. And what Jesus is, is trying to help the disciples understand, what he's trying to help me and you understand, is that we have something better than his physical presence in our life. Through his death, resurrection, and ascension, and his sending of the Holy Spirit, we now have the same Spirit that empowered the ministry of Christ dwelling in us. 
We now have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead at work in us. We now have the same spirit that healed the sick, that raised the dead, that calmed the seas, dwelling in us. And what Jesus is pushing the disciples to understand is that if they want to know the fullness of life that he knows, they need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will only come in that fullness after Jesus is returned to the Father. And so it's a challenging thing for us to consider today of Jesus left so that you and I could receive the Holy Spirit. And if he believed the presence of the Spirit was better than his physical presence, then who are we to resist the work of the Spirit? Who are we to say, yeah, but that's a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, but that's different than than the rest of my culture. Yeah, but that's kind of supernatural. If Jesus' plan all along was to come to live a sinless life, to be crucified, died, buried, to be raised from the dead, to ascend into heaven so that he could, all of it was so he could send us the Holy Spirit. And if that's his intention, our only posture is one of acceptance. And just saying, come Holy Spirit. I love the way Dr. Grant Osborne summarizes this idea. He says, through the Spirit, the disciples will share in the very life of God that they have seen in Jesus. When Jesus sends the Holy Spirit, it's so that we can move from followers and fans to active participants. His goal was never to start a religion where we did our best to follow his rules. His goal was always to open the door to a supernatural relationship with God where we walk with him every day, where he speaks to us as naturally as we speak to each other, and where we know he is with us and he goes before us. And Jesus tells us this is possible by taking our place through the forgiveness of our sins in his family and by receiving the Holy Spirit whom he will send to us. And then just in case you you still may be tempted to think that the gift of the Holy Spirit is just for a a specific subset of Christians, I want to encourage you once again, the Holy Spirit is a gift from Jesus. And he's a gift from Jesus to every single one of us. No one is exempt. Yes, he is for your aunt that loves to go to worship nights all the time. He is for pastors and he is for missionaries. He is for those who give their lives in prayer and service to him. But he is also for every single person who places their faith in Jesus Christ. In the same way you walk with the Father and the Son, you are designed to walk with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is Jesus' gift to his church. Not to a particularly holy, small group of people, but to all who place their faith in Jesus Christ. We'll finish up this morning in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2 by seeing that the Holy Spirit is for you. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I think I've said it on every scripture we've read, but we will come back to this at a later point, and talk about it in more depth. But for today, what I want you to understand is when Jesus promises the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's so that we will receive power to be his witnesses all over the world. You and I are here today because for 2,000 years, Christians have received the power of the Holy Spirit. We are the ends of the earth. We are the ones that the disciples never could have imagined the gospel being planted and taking root. And what I want you to hear in Acts 1-8 is that you includes you. It includes every person who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ. You will receive power. And so, so this is the promise that Jesus makes to the disciples right before he ascends into heaven. He tells them, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit, which my father has promised. And he tells them why they're going to wait, because you're going to receive power and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus ascends to the heaven, ascends to heaven and the disciples, those gathered with him, they obey. They go back to Jerusalem and they gather together and they begin to pray. And they pray for day after day and week after week. And they don't know what it's going to look like when the Holy Spirit shows up. They don't really have a frame of reference for when God pours out his spirit, this is what happens. 
All they know is Jesus said to wait, and so they decide they're going to wait and pray until Jesus fulfills his promise. And then on the day of Pentecost, a, a religious festival for the Jewish people, they're in an upper room. It seems like they're somewhat near the temple. And the streets outside are filled with pilgrims who've come in from around the world to celebrate the, 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 the festival of Pentecost. And on that day, the Holy Spirit descends as Jesus had intended. And Acts tells us a story that they were all together in the upper room and the Holy Spirit began to fill them with his power and they began to speak in other tongues, other languages as the Spirit enabled them. They were languages that they had not learned, but they were languages that the people outside understood. And the people outside heard them declaring the glory and praises of God in their native languages. And so they began to ask each other, hey, what's going on up there? And, and some mocked them and made fun and said, those, those men must be drunk. Well, the, the, those that are gathered in the upper room, they sense the commotion that's going on outside. It's, it's possible perhaps somebody has come up to try to interrupt them. And Peter stands up and it, it seems as if he's in some kind of elevated perch, maybe a, a balcony or some steps that, that overlook the crowd who's gathered around. As we read through the story, we, we come to understand there are thousands of people who have now turned their attention toward Peter in this moment. If you know Peter's story, you know that Peter is the disciple who denies Jesus on the night he's arrested. Peter's the one who lacks courage to admit to a servant girl that he knows who Jesus is. And yet on the day of Pentecost, he has been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He has received the promise of Jesus. And in the face of a crowd of thousands that are launching accusations and questions towards him, Peter quiets them down and he begins to proclaim by the power of the Holy Spirit, who Jesus was, what Jesus did, and what is happening on that day. And he tells them, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. Instead, this is the gift of Jesus Christ. Jesus was the Savior. Jesus is the Messiah. He has come to take away the sins of the world. Peter begins to connect the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with Old Testament prophecies where God said he would pour out his Spirit on all flesh. And he tells them what was written is being, is being done right here in front of you today. And as Peter comes to the, the end of his short little message and explanation, the people, it says, are cut to the heart. And they want to know, what do we do? In fact, you, you can read it. We'll read it in Genesis, or sorry, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. I want you to, to notice a couple things. When the Holy Spirit works, the first thing he does is he points people to Jesus. And so this morning, if you're here and you think all that Holy Spirit stuff, like that's interesting, never heard that before, but there's something else in my heart. What that is this morning, is this the Holy Spirit working to point your heart to Jesus Christ? to help you understand that, that you need to submit and surrender. You need to receive forgiveness and new life. And when the people that are gathered there, they say, Peter, what do you do? He says, first, repent and be baptized. Second, receive the Holy Spirit. And, and we'll talk at length in the coming weeks about how the Spirit is active in our salvation, how every believer walks with the Holy Spirit. And we'll also talk about how the scriptures present a second work of the Holy Spirit, where we are filled with his power to achieve his purposes. But for today, what, what I want you to understand is this promise from Peter in verse 39. He says, this promise of salvation and the Holy Spirit, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So again, place yourself as best you can in that moment. You're gathered somewhere near the temple in Jerusalem. It's, it's the height, it's the closest you think you can ever get to God. And you hear this commotion and this man begins to stand up and speak. And as he speaks, he's talking about this man named Jesus and how he's the Messiah and he's the savior. And as he speaks, there's something in your heart that just, that just bursts to life. And you think I have to have that. 
And this man begins to tell you, hey, good news. You can repent and be baptized. You're welcomed into the family. And more than that, you can receive the spirit who's been poured out. And maybe you're in the crowd and you're thinking, but I'm not particularly religious, but I haven't done all the things I'm supposed to do. And it's as if Peter speaks directly to you and says, this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. This promise is for those who are geographically far off on that day. This promise is for those who are spiritually far off on that day. The promise of salvation and the Holy Spirit is God's irrevocable promise to humanity. You will receive it. And then as you think about that, I want you to transition now back to to your life and think 2,000 years ago, Peter prophesied that you would receive salvation in Christ and that you would receive the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, this promise is for all whom the Lord our God will call. It's everyone that day and everyone this day. There has never been a moment from the day of Pentecost to now that the Spirit has not been active and available. There has never been a person that the Spirit has been withheld from. His plan to be released into all the world, into every life, to magnify Jesus and to fill us with his power. And so my prayer for us individually, my prayer for us as a church is that we will be people of the spirit, that we will not settle for intellectual knowledge of faith, that we will not know by definition what it means to be a Christian, but that we will open our hearts, our minds, and our lives to the fullness of the promise of the Holy Spirit. And he will lead you to Jesus and then he will fill you with his power. And if you'll stand with me today, I wanna pray for us and give us an opportunity to respond to what God is saying. Jesus, we come today and we are thankful that you have given the Holy Spirit to us. God, we see that this is part of your plan and we come no matter our background, our assumptions, our problems, and we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit into our lives today. Holy Spirit, we wanna know you not as just a force or an idea, but we wanna know you as a person. We wanna know the power of your presence in our life. So I wanna invite you, if if you're here and and you just wanna pray this very simple prayer of surrender of Holy Spirit, I, I want you to come in my life. Will you take your hands, just place your palms towards heaven with me? It's just a, just a position of surrender and submission. Holy Spirit, we come. We recognize that you are God and we recognize that you are a gift from Jesus. We recognize that you are for us, that you desire to be active and present in our lives. And so Holy Spirit, we invite you into our hearts, into our minds, into our lives, into our relationships. Holy Spirit, we want the fullness of all that God has for us. We don't want to be put off by your supernatural nature, but instead we want to invite everything that Jesus designed for us into our lives. So Holy Spirit, will you speak and move? Will you overcome our objections? Will you move us past our uncertainties? And will you help us to surrender to the authority of the scriptures and to the promise of Jesus Christ that you are for all whom the Lord will call. Jesus, I pray if there are those in the room this morning who've never made that decision to follow you and surrender their lives. Today, Lord, may they repent of their sins and may they be welcomed into your family as the sons and daughters of God. And Lord, I I pray for the rest of us who've said yes to you. May we continually seek the infilling presence of your Holy Spirit and surrender to all that you have for us. We lay down every objection And we open our hearts and our minds to you. And we pray very simply, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Fill us with your power, fill us with your presence. Release your gifts in us and through us. Give us all that we need. Be our advocate and helper. Be our counselor and comforter. Holy Spirit, will you come and make the truth of who Jesus is come alive in our hearts and minds today. Holy Spirit, will you come and bring resurrection life into our relationships? Holy Spirit, will you come and release your gifts of healing? Release your gifts of knowledge, release your gifts of wisdom, release your discernment. 
Holy Spirit, you see all of our needs and we invite you to be the answer. We invite you to speak and to move. Holy Spirit, we invite you to overwhelm and overcome every part of our life, every part of our mind, every part of our relationships. Holy Spirit, will you fill our homes, will you fill our jobs? Will you fill us with your presence as we drive to work and school? Will you fill our classrooms and hallways with the reality of who you are? Come, Holy Spirit. You see our needs and requests and just pray that you would come in your power and your presence. Holy Spirit, we wanna experience you in all that Jesus designed for us. So as we, as we sing, as we pray, Holy Spirit, we just invite you, come in your fullness, come in your power, come in your peace, come in your presence. Lead us into an experience of you that Jesus designed us for. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Christian Chapel family, thank you for joining us for worship today. I'm praying that this series on the Holy Spirit will be used by God to speak to you, to challenge you, and to draw you into an even closer relationship with him. If there's anything in your life that we can pray with you about, please drop that off at christianchapel.com prayer. If you would like to partner with us in sharing the good news of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit with others, you can do that at christianchapel.com give. We're praying that this week, the Holy Spirit is personal and powerful in your life to achieve every good thing that God has in store for you. God bless you. Have a great week.